And if you hear somebody behind you, whatever you do, don't turn around. The Power Drill Massacre. Megan Brooke gets involved in a severe car crash with her boyfriend, Jeff West. As she desperately explores around the Pocono Mountains during sunset to seek help, she stumbles upon an abandoned factory in a dilapidated condition, where she becomes the target of the notorious Power Drill Killer, who has been making the area seem like a haunted and cursed place. Hi folks, I'm R, your narrator. You can follow me on Twitter and send me game suggestions. This video will contain spoilers. With that in mind, let's begin. It's 1987 in Pocono Mountains when Megan and her boyfriend Jeff get into a car accident, with Jeff sustaining severe injuries, preventing him from moving around. Megan leaves the car and picks up their flashlight from the trunk of the car as the sun is setting to seek for help. She soon stumbles upon a seemingly abandoned rundown factory called the Brandon Sawmill. With no other choice in hand, Megan tries to find the telephone within this building and call for help. As soon as Megan enters through the only unlocked door, the door behind her gets locked by someone trapping her within. Megan then finds a ripped out newspaper article from 1982 of two missing campers in the area whose belongings and campsite were found, but no remains of them. This concerns Megan immensely as someone seems to have collected this newspaper clipping, someone who could have had a connection to this missing case. Otherwise, how would a newspaper clipping find its way to a long abandoned factory? Megan, already determined to find the telephone, stays on guard and proceeds further. This concern soon reveals to be not unfounded, as a large figure dressed in white protective clothes, wearing a white face mask, wielding a power drill, sits on chasing after Megan while screaming like a pig. After evading this psychopathic deranged individual, suffering from a massive shock and eventually catching her breath, Megan stumbles upon another newspaper clipping titled Pocano Vanishings, reporting on 12 missing campers in the period between 1978 to 1985. The vanishing of these campers under strange circumstances suggest that they were possibly abducted from their campsites. This leads to a theory Megan forms which she thinks that this individual possibly was the abductor. Otherwise, why would there be so many newspaper clippings? This power drill wielder must be the serial killer who keeps track of his murders as if they're some sort of a trophy. Appalled and traumatized to these findings, Megan decides to forget about the telephone and find a way out. As Megan explores the factory further, she finds a library containing many documents relating to the site. A newspaper clipping from 1981 reports on the factory closing down. This confirms that the newspaper clippings dated after 1981 were collected by the homicidal maniac chasing after Megan. The Brandon Sawmill, after its closure, was due to be leased to the State Park Commission despite the uproar of some residents who labeled the site as cursed due to the decades of mishaps and deaths within it. The article continues that the original building was an orphanage called the Sunshine Children's Orphanage, which was built by the millionaire Russell Mort, who rose to fame after his inventions during World War II. Later in his life, he ended his life due to allegations of child abuse inside the orphanage. As Mort didn't have any descendants or he didn't mention any in his will, the property was forfeited to the state which was left abandoned until the 1975 fire. The remains of the building was converted into the Brandon Sawmill, which many accidents happened within, taking seven workers' lives. 
the circumstances under of which the accidents took place were very suspect as the equipment seemed to have been sabotaged, hinting towards some sort of foul play. After collecting three keys colored green, blue and red, Megan manages to open a door with three correspondingly colored locks. This leads Megan to a long corridor where she finds a little scared girl. She calls out to the girl but she sits on running. Megan runs towards her to get some help and understand what's going on when suddenly the psychopathic killer appears from a door and sits on chasing Megan. The colors within the corridor start changing, creating a surreal, horrific experience, with the scene coming to a slow end, with Megan still running in the never-ending corridor. This eventually fades into the night sky full of stars, with radio reporting on the ceasefire of Iran and Iraq war, which was in 1988, with another report announcing the remains of a car found with both Jeff and Megan missing. Then, unsettling screams and moaning sounds of a woman is heard, with the game coming to an abrupt end. Today is renewing its call for a ceasefire between Iraq and Iran, as negotiations with senior Iranian officials appear to have stalled. In local news, police believe to have found the remains of Jeff West after uncovering a wrecked vehicle off of Route 447. West and Megan Brooke of Montclair, New Jersey have been missing since May. Brooke's body has not been discovered. News at 11. This indicates that despite this ending being known as the good ending, Megan and Jeff didn't make it out alive and presumably were killed by the power drill killer, with their car only being found one year after their disappearance in 1988. The long, never-ending corridor with the running girl creates a paranormal element within the story. Unlocking the second ending creates some room for speculations. Megan stumbles upon a secret room which turns out to be the power drill killer's lair. As soon as she enters, the door behind her closes, trapping her within. The walls inside are decorated with child's drawings under the old wallpapers, which is reminiscent of the time this building used to be an orphanage. The scenery soon throws the atrocities of what have been happening at Megan. There's a lot of blood smeared all over the room, there are human remains all over, and a skeleton can be seen on the old stained mattress. There are tools of torture, which seem to be even used for dismembering human parts, as there's a bone which was forcefully shoved down the toilet. On a table, Megan finds teapots and cups as if they're for tea parties, and cages which the killer seemingly uses to trap his victims. The killer then suddenly comes to the room and puts Megan in a cage and strips her clothes off. The killer tries to briefly communicate with Megan, which Megan doesn't understand as he mumbles and sounds like a child, which angers the killer, who rushes in with the power drill and executes Megan. <laughs> A biblical line then appears from Revelation 2014, talking about sin and the second religious death, which is in afterlife. 
The killer seems to have been one of the orphans who was raised in the Sunshine Orphanage after World War II. As alleged, Russell Mort was the owner of the orphanage who abused the orphans and took his own life after it went public. The killer might be one of the kids who was abused by Mort, who couldn't live past the trauma and sustained a mental disorder, keeping him at state of a toddler. As it's been confirmed by the developer, the killer has the mind of a three-year-old. That is why his lair has children drawings on the walls and he has a tea party kit. The killer also makes unintelligible child sounds, more like mumbles as if he's incapable of speaking. The killer chooses a power drill as his favorite tool to kill his victims. This might indicate that he has some sort of experience with power tools. He might have been the person behind the equipment sabotages in the Brandon Sommel factory. It's possible he grew up still suffering from the PTSD of his childhood with an underdeveloped mind tampering with the equipment and causing fatal injuries. He also wears protective clothes, further indicating that he must have performed some sort of factory work to obtain such a peril. The paranormal part leading to the complex ending might be answered with some theories relating to the biblical verse. The long surreal corridor might be a pathway to the afterlife, as it changes colors and looks from a normal looking scene into a bloody red scene and finally into a bright white scene. The blood red scene might indicate that Megan died already by the killer who was on her tail, who eventually steps into the white corridor being the representation of the white tunnel to heaven or afterlife something many people have reported when they wake up from a coma and generally believe to be a pathway to afterlife. Therefore, it's a possibility that Megan actually died in the factory and traveled to the other world. The biblical verse, however, suggests how sinful people die from a second death in the afterlife, burning in hell. This gives rise to another theory that whatever Megan experienced in here might be the representation of a purgatory or hell. It's possible that Megan committed some sort of a crime or sin that made her suffer as a result. There isn't much information about the backstory of the protagonist and what sins she might have committed. So this theory is up to debate. Megan runs after a child in the endless corridor, which might suggest in theory that she committed some sort of homicide making her experience it in such way. But the biblical verse indeed refers to the second spiritual death, which is followed after the physical death in the world, hinting out that Megan might be dying or suffering in the afterlife, which she does by the hands of the terrifying power drill killer. A sequel was intended to go underway and possibly unveil much more information about the story, filling out the plot holes, and all the unanswered questions. However, it was unfortunately cancelled. That's it for today's video, folks. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to stay tuned by hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell. You can also follow me on Twitter and send me game suggestions. As always, it's been your host, R. Until the next video, have a fantastic day.